this is the last lesson of Unit 1, uh, and it is fairly dense, and I'm going to try to go through it as quickly as I can without really losing quality of content. Uh, there are, again, a lot of seeds being planted in this lecture uh, related to the American Revolution. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a couple of minority groups, primarily women and blacks, uh, that have not really been mentioned much up to this point. That will be part of my discussion of the colonial, tent, uh, colonial culture. And then I'll move on to how other aspects of colonial culture are going to raise tension with England. And that's important to note because whenever we get to the next unit, this tension is going to reach a boiling point. And when that boiling point is reached, you'll have the American Revolution and the war for independence. So basically, this lecture is the final one in setting up the coming of the American Revolution, uh, especially uh, backside this lecture. So we'll, we'll see more of that as the lecture progresses. And again, uh, the next unit, Unit 2, will be all about the final straws, uh, such as the Stamp Act, uh, such as the Boston Tea Party, uh, things you may have heard of before. Uh, eventually, we'll get to the writing of the Declaration of Independence and the War of Independence itself. So this lecture is going to be setting us up for the next unit, which is entirely on the American Revolution and its aftermath. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about minority groups during uh, the colonial period. When it came to women, uh, the role of women in the majority of colonial society was to basically be very domesticated, was to do things within the home. The, the role of the man was outside of the home to be involved in politics. Uh, if they had enough money they, and property, they might vote. But the role of the woman largely was to stay in the household and to educate children, to keep a, a good house, a happy house, uh, kind of a lot of stereotypes of women that you've seen maybe even up till today. Uh, the husband, when at home, was in charge, but if the husband was absent, the women ran the household. Uh, now, uh, single women sometimes would work outside the home, but once they got married, basically their role was to go to the home, be good wives to their husbands, be obedient to their husbands, and be good mothers. Uh, and this picture that you see here on the left, it kind of idealizes the role of the woman in the home. You see the women preparing food, uh, and you see the women keeping the house warm over here, and then you see the children playing. So that would be the expected role of women during the colonial period overall. If you were an unmarried woman, you might see more rights. For example, if you were an unmarried woman and uh, your father and mother were both passed on, you might inherit their property. Interestingly, if you got married, you did not retain your property rights, and actually the husband would get the property rights. Uh, and so uh, you'll see George Washington, for example, was not exceptionally wealthy on his own, uh, but George Washington, and we'll get to him later on uh, in the next unit, uh, he basically, quote, marries up. He marries into a wealthier family and basically gets his wife's uh, property, which at the time would have been considered a norm. Uh, I'm speaking very briefly about women, as you can see, but the main point is that women do have a role, a very set role, uh, that by today's standards would be considered subordinate and to many oppressive. At the time, this was the accepted role of the woman. In the home, subservient to the husband, and with little to no property rights. The other major group that I'll talk about will be uh, African slaves. So African slaves are actually going to exist in all of the 13 colonies, but much more so in the southern colonies. Now initially the enslavement of Africans was uh, justified on religious grounds. There was this idea that if Africans aren't Christians, uh, then they are, for, for whatever reason, it, it's okay to enslave them. Now, what's going to end up happening, though, is that a lot of Africans are going to convert to Christianity, and the slave owners don't want to have to give up on their slaves, so the slave-owning class, which was the wealthy planter class that had all the power, in especially the southern colonies, uh, they're going to start changing the rules. So even though I just told you a moment ago that slavery did exist in various forms in all the colonies, I'm really going to concentrate on the role of slavery and slaves in the southern colonies because that's where it becomes most prevalent. So 
if religious justification didn't work, eventually you're going to start seeing laws being passed that base slavery on race. And I believe I've told you in earlier uh, lectures that slavery has existed for about the existence of civilization. It's been around for a very long time, but the American version of slavery is one that's largely based on race. It was based on race because Africans were easy to distinguish from the rest of the colonists because the rest of the colonists weren't African by heritage. Uh, and it was a very easy distinction to make. There were some free blacks in, in the American colonies, but the majority of, of, of blacks in the, the colonies were uh, enslaved and mostly uh, brought in uh, through the triangular trade process and mostly in the southern colonies. Now notice what else I put here. The status of slavery eventually is going to be a hereditary thing. Eventually, the idea, it becomes law, is going to be that uh, slaves are slaves, but if you're born to a slave, then you are also, by heritage, a slave yourself. So this makes the institution of slavery race-based and an ongoing institution. If you're, You basically are a slave based on the condition of your mother. Now, obviously, slaves do not want to be enslaved. No one wants to be denied their freedom. And so there are going to be a series of laws passed to help control and maintain this, this uh, hold over the Af people of African descent. And one interesting thing about the slave codes is that they do emphasize the, the role of race in slavery. And so basically, you did have lower class whites. We've learned about Bacon's Rebellion and how some lower class whites were unhappy. Well, now you're going to see a distinction being made more and more between lower class whites and lower class blacks. And so this, the idea that these laws are emphasizing race as a justification for different treatment it basically creates racism. Uh, racism uh, is not a, a, a thing natural to children. It is something that is taught. And here the legal system, especially in the South, uh, the Southern colonies, is going to basically create racism as part of Southern culture and as part of a justification of slavery. And even after slavery is over, uh, in American history, too, you'll learn about how this racism is very deeply entrenched into the, the minds of Southern whites, and they will, through racism, start passing other laws like the famous Jim Crow segregation laws that you, that you may have heard of before. So here you see the beginning of American racism uh, largely centered on putting whites above blacks. Uh, and these laws, again, like I said a, a moment ago, they are meant to keep them in a lower status, socially speaking. Even poor whites that can never dream of affording a slave would still support slavery because it kept them from being at the very bottom of the social ladder. Now another major thing, another major purpose of the slave codes was to make the slaves easier to control. I've already told you about how they were easier to control because oftentimes they spoke different languages and they were in a foreign land that they were not familiar with. There were other aspects to the slave codes. For example, they could not own property, especially weapons, because they could use these weapons to free themselves, obviously. If there was a trial, maybe there was a, a crime that had been committed, and there was a person of African descent that had been a witness to the crime, they were not allowed to testify against the, the uh, defendant if the defendant was white, because to be able to, uh, for a black person to be able to testify against a white person, in a sense, kind of signifies some sort of equality. Finally, uh, and, and by the way, and that was something that the whites uh, in the South did not want to have. They had wanted no notions of equality. Finally, you'll see a couple other examples of slave codes, and that will be uh, the idea that slaves could not travel without the knowledge of their owner. They could not assemble without the knowledge of their owner. And the reason for that was because if they could travel freely, then they might become more accustomed to freedom and demand it more. They could not assemble freely because if they could assemble, they might get together and plan some sort of rebellion. And shortly, I will tell you about the, the largest rebellion that ever took place uh, during the colonial period. That'll be the Stono Rebellion. Okay, so working as a slave obviously is going to be very difficult. Uh, slaves are going to work long days, often from dawn until dusk, hard physical labor, 
uh, and I will revisit this topic more than once. Uh, I will not shortchange this topic or shortchange the conditions that the slaves lived in. So even if I'm not always talking about slave conditions, you'll, you should know that throughout this course until the Civil War, slavery is going on in the background, if not the foreground. So it says here in the notes that the slaves often worked long days, they performed hard labor, and sometimes they were beaten or given some other sort of physical punishment. Like you see here in the picture on the left, you see uh, this slave is being punished by being branded which simultaneously marks them as property to an owner, but also serves as a punishment. And you can see that in this picture, this is being done with other slaves looking on, because other slaves, if they see this sort of punishment, are going to be more likely to violate the rules of the master. Uh, there's a problem, though, with the idea of, of uh, beating slaves or branding slaves, and, it, and that is that if you leave a physical mark on a slave, and I'm not trying to be trivial here, but that basically hurts the value, the financial value of the slave. It hurts the resale value of the slave. If you're trying to sell a piece of property like a car, and you take a sledgehammer to your car and you dent it all up, it's going to hurt its resale value. And the same thing applied to slaves. If you planned on selling your slave, you own one, you wanted your slave to physically be in peak condition. So oftentimes punishments would be more psychological, more emotional. And this is one of the more uh, terrible, I would say, parts of slavery and, and ways in which slaves are controlled. Oftentimes, slave owners would uh, sell off slaves for profit, and oftentimes they would break up families. So here you see in this picture a family, and it's a family with a mother and a father and a young child, and they are very likely to be sold to separate owners. And if you were a couple, or if you were a family, and a family member was sold off, you were almost guaranteed never to see them again. So one way to control slaves without physically damaging them was to threaten to break up families, uh, threaten to sell off a husband, threaten to sell off a wife, so threaten to sell off a brother, sister, father, mother, son, or daughter. And uh, sometimes the, the threat of breaking up families would be used to control slaves. Sometimes it would happen anyway because it was financially best for the owners and they didn't really care what they were doing emotionally to these slaves because they viewed the slaves as property, uh, not as people. Now, I'm mentioning all of these things because as hard as slave life was and as, as, as harsh as the punishments and the threats could be, slaves still would resist. And to have such major threats like breaking up your family, threats like getting branded or beaten, and the fact that these slaves are still rebelling shows just how bad their conditions were and how desperate they were. So there are going to be some examples of slave resistance. Now oftentimes slaves did not want to get beaten, they did not want to risk losing a family member, so they would resist passively. They might do something like work as slowly as they could get away with without the owner noticing. They might uh, play on the stereotype that they were intellectually inferior and play dumb. They would say, Mr. Uh, Master, I don't understand the instructions you're giving me, so I can't do the work you're telling me to do. And oftentimes the slave owner would say, oh yeah, that's right, because you are immensely inferior to me, so you can't do it. Uh, and so the slaves would kind of play on that stereotype. Other things might happen. They might uh, sabotage equipment. They might spit in their master's food if they worked in the house uh, making food. Uh, and of course, an obvious one is they might run away. Now, you've heard of runaway slaves before, probably. You've heard of the Underground Railroad. Uh, this is not the time period of the Underground Railroad, but I will talk about the Underground Railroad uh, when it forms later on. That happens in the 1800s. Sometimes slaves re, uh, revolted with violence, and the most famous example is going to be the Stono Rebellion of 1739. In South Carolina, just south of Charlestown, you're going to see a rebellion that turns violent, and these slaves are going to kill their masters. They are going to obtain whatever weapons they can find, which they don't find a lot. I'm not sure if they were able to obtain guns, but they were able to obtain uh, sharpened objects like, like knives. And uh, this rebellion potentially could have gotten out of hand uh, in terms of, uh, from the, the uh, slave owner perspective. They're going to kill their owners. They are going to gather up other slaves. They're going to gather, I can't remember, I feel like it was around 100, maybe a little bit less, of these slaves are going to gather. 
and they are going to start going from plantation to plantation and they are going to start killing slave owners. And there's a, a case where they go to this one, I believe, grocery store and they go and they kill all the slave owners in the grocery store and they leave their heads on the front porch as a kind of a form of revenge. They're going to end up making their way southward. They're going to try to make their way down to Florida. Uh, and the reason that they're going to go to, towards Florida is because Florida was owned by Spain. It wasn't owned by uh, the English colonies, and they felt like they could find refuge there. If the Spanish couldn't give them refuge, then they could find Native Americans, the Seminole Native Americans in, in Florida, that could maybe give them refuge. Unfortunately for them, the local militias are going to respond, and they are going to capture these runaways. They are going to kill... Uh, if not all of them, they're going to kill the leaders of this rebellion, and the rebellion fails. However, this does speak to the fact that slaves were willing sometimes to risk life and kill and die uh, in an effort for freedom, and there will be other slave rebellions. One other thing to note about this, and then I'll move on, is that any time there was a slave rebellion, it would convince slave owners that the slave uh, codes were not strict enough. So every time there's a slave rebellion, when it's put down, uh, the slave codes are going to become stricter. You're going to see things like they're not going to be allowed to learn how to read and write because keeping them ignorant is going to make them less likely to rebel. Uh, so we'll come back to that theme later on. And it is possible for a slave rebellion to be successful. There was a revolution in Haiti called the Haitian Revolution where basically the slaves overthrew all the masters in the entire island. Uh, so it was possible. Slave owners are going to be aware of this and uh, they are going to get stricter as time goes on. Okay, now I'm going to change themes. Uh, I'm going to start talking more about the growing tension between the colonist and the mother country, England. Okay, so we'll start with the left-hand box, and then we'll go to the right-hand box, and then we'll see how both of the trends mentioned in the boxes play to overall loyalty to England. Uh, so by the 1700s, by the century in which the American Revolution took place, you will see the population of the colonies grow and grow rapidly. It's going to grow especially rapidly in the New England area. You don't have to know that distinction, but it is useful to know. It makes sense. Uh, the New England Puritans wanted a city upon a hill. They wanted to be a Christian example to the world. And the bigger their population, the bigger of an example they could be. Uh, overall, families are going to average nine children apiece. Uh, in New England, it's going to be closer to uh, between eight and nine. A piece. So you do have very large families. And basically the population is going to double every 25 years. By the time of the American Revolution, uh, the American colonists uh, pop, uh, have a population of about 2.5 million. England at the time has a population of 7.5 million. So by the time of the American Revolution, the colonists are a third of the size of their mother country, and they're going to start to challenge uh, the uh, authority of this mother country for multiple reasons. One of the most noteworthy things about this slide, though, is that over time you're going to see increasingly people that were of English heritage that were born in America, that were born in the American colonies. Never had been seen England, had only heard about England. And if you've never seen this mother country that rules over you, you're probably not going to feel much loyalty toward it. For example, my great-grandparents, I believe, are from Germany on my mother's side of the family. However, I have no feeling whatsoever of allegiance uh, to Germany. Uh, and, and that's what's going to happen is that uh, the further that the generations get from the people that had actually come over from England, the less loyalty they're going to feel toward England. Uh, if you are, for example, if your parents came from another country, you probably do not feel as strong a tie to that country as your parents do. And, and that's kind of a natural thing. So by 1776... The vast majority of people of English heritage, they had loyalty to England because they had been taught so from birth to have that loyalty, but they probably didn't feel it as strongly because they never actually experienced England itself. The other demographic change that occurs, and now we're going to go over to the right-hand box, uh, is going to be the fact that not everyone coming to the colonies, those that were immigrating to the colonies, were coming from England. By 1776, over a quarter million people in the New World, in the English colonies, are not of English heritage themselves. A lot of these people were Germans, 
a lot of these people were Dutch, which means they came from the Netherlands, and they moved oftentimes to the middle colonies, which is important to note because uh, Philadelphia, which is located in the middle colonies, seen here on the map, I'm pointing it out now, uh, that's where your Declaration of Independence is going to be written. So not only do you have a lot of, of people that have never, that are of English heritage that were uh, born here, and therefore don't feel much loyalty to England, you have a lot of people who are either neutral when it comes to England, or if you're Scots-Irish, you're actually uh, fairly opposed to England. So the Scots-Irish, uh, they had been oppressed by the English, they move over, uh, to the New World, they end up moving to the kind of frontier areas, uh, kind of along the Appalachian Mountains, and uh, they have no loyalty to England whatsoever. So, and then, of course, if you talk about Africans, the Africans have been brought over in a forced migration through the Middle Passage, and they obviously had no allegiance whatsoever to England. So if you look at these different groups that are listed, you'll notice that many of them are not as I've said before, English at all, and some of them are hostile. If not neutral to England, they're hostile to England. And by 1776, the year that the uh, Declaration of Independence is signed, you'll have a sizable population that never had any allegiance to England to begin with. This chart, I think, kind of explains it all. Uh, by the time of the American Revolution, you'll see that you have lots of different groups in the English colonies, some of them neutral towards England, some of them hostile towards England, but even among those that are English in heritage, less than half of the colonists are of English heritage. So at the time of the American Revolution, less than half of the English are that are of English heritage uh, make up the entire population, and of those that are English, their loyalty isn't that strong because the vast majority of this 49% is uh, born in the American colonies, not born in England, had never seen England. So a very small part of the English population had ever seen England, a very small uh, percentage of the population overall had any real strong ties to England itself. And that is summed up in this slide here. So by 1776, most people in the colonies had either been born in the American colonies or in a country other than England. So, uh, by 1776, when England starts to pass laws that uh, the colonists don't like or they outright hate, they're already kind of poised to think about uh, breaking away from England because they already had little to no allegiance to England itself. So, putting these two bullets together, the fact that loyalty was not that strong to begin with because the uh, colonists uh, were not either born outside of England or had been born in America. Uh, that combined with the fact that England's going to start passing some laws that they don't like. Uh, by 1776, the year uh, that the war begins, uh, respect for England's authority had declined. And honestly, this last bullet here is not entirely accurate. The Declaration of Independence is going to make the revolution official in 1776, but we honestly had been fighting the revolution uh, the year prior to 1776. So most historians actually uh, mark the revolution as beginning in 1775 with the battles of Lexington and Concord, but it doesn't become official till 1776. Now, there are some events that happened before 1776 that I need to mention, and that's going to be the topic of the backside of this lecture. And they will foreshadow the coming of the American Revolution. So you already see how in the mindset of a lot of American colonists, how they're not as loyal to England as maybe the initial people had been. Uh, but here you're going to see on the back side of the lecture more specific events that cause the tension to go up. So let's remember the idea of mercantilism. Remember that mercantilism, which was mentioned in uh, the earlier lectures, uh, remember that it's this idea that a country's power is tied to its wealth. And one way to uh, be wealthy is to create colonies because colonies can provide you with raw materials that the mother country might not have itself. Now, England, of course, was an island nation and it was very limited in its land, it was limited in its resources, and so England knew that it could get lots of raw materials from the colonies. 
remember uh, the, the triangular trade, the different trade routes that were taking place along the Atlantic Ocean. Well, England, if they really wanted to make a lot of money for themselves and have a lot of wealth for themselves, they would uh, control the trade that the colonies were uh, uh, doing. Now, obviously, England is going to be wealthy because of the colonies, because if they have colonies, then they can get stuff from the colonies, and they don't have to buy from other countries. That whole idea of, of uh, exporting more than you import. If you have colonies that provide you with things like tobacco, hopefully some gold, or uh, furs, or, or timber, or some ships, uh, if the colonies provide you those things, which I talked about in the previous lecture, then you don't have to buy them from other countries. You don't have to import from other countries. In fact, you can sell these items to other countries. So what ends up happening is the English government is going to start really, from the colonial mindset, they're going to start to exploit the colonies for their own financial gain to meet the goals of mercantilism. This cartoon is the best cartoon that I've found, political cartoon, that explains mercantilism. So mercantilism can be a very complex idea. Here it is in visual form. You see the mother country here, that being England, and you see what the colonies can give to the mother country. They can provide gold and silver if possible. They can provide food or other items such as tobacco. They can provide raw materials such as timber or things that are mined out of the ground like iron, uh, etc. But notice that in the end, the relationship between the colony and the mother country. And if you look at this cartoon, first off, the, the, the caption says the mercantile argument uh, for colonial expansion, but you'll see here that the, the role is subservient. These three women are basically servants to the mother country. They are not independent. They are not free, and that feeling of being exploited for the sake of the mother country is going to be a negative feeling that's going to grow among the colonists. So over a hundred years before the Declaration of Independence comes along, before the American Revolution comes along, England tries to exploit their relationship with the colonies, uh, potentially could have started the American Revolution early, over a century early, and that's going to be the Navigation Acts. So the Navigation Acts are going to be a series of laws that are going to be passed uh, that are going to exploit the colonies in order to help England be richer. In other words, to help England obtain their mercantilist goals. For example, one of these laws said that colonists could only trade on English ships. And that actually is going to be beneficial to the New England colonies because they made English ships. So some of the Navigation Acts are actually going to be positive, but in the end, uh, remember that the colonists are used to self-government, they're used to local government, and all of a sudden this government from across the ocean, many of which uh, of the colonists, have never, many of the colonists have never even seen this country, they are going to resent this uh, sudden kind of heavy handedness from England. Especially when England is going to start saying that some of these products can only be sold to England. In other words, if you're a tobacco farmer, all of a sudden you've lost all of your non-English customers and you're standing to lose a lot of money. If you are um, cutting down timber in the New England colonies, all of a sudden you can only sell your lumber to England and not to all the other European countries. There are some other laws that uh, were part of the Navigation Acts, uh, but for the sake of this class I'm going to be simple and just list this. Uh, because it will create a negative reaction. These colonists are used to being uh, locally governed by the House of Burgesses or by town meetings, and now all of a sudden England is starting to pass rules on them that they weren't used to. This would be like having a teacher in your classroom that for the first few weeks doesn't give you any rules, and then all of a sudden starts to put a lot of rules on you once you're used to having a lot of freedom in the classroom. And from the teacher's perspective, I can tell you that that does not work out very well, and you've probably experienced this before yourself. Uh, here's another picture of triangular trade, and as you can see, like I said before, there are multiple triangles involved. Okay, so what's the colonial reaction going to be? Overall, it's going to be very negative, and the colonists are going to feel like these laws are restricting their economies, they're all of a sudden only able to trade with England with certain goods. If they are able to sell another good, to an, uh, a, con a country besides England, England is probably going to force these uh, ships to pass through England's harbors first so they can tax them before they go on to other countries. 
Uh, that was another one of the navigation hacks I didn't have you write down. So how do the colonists respond? Well, they're going to start smuggling. They're going to start sneaking these items to other countries. They're going to sneak items to the Caribbean islands, which again were called the West Indies at the time. They're going to smuggle items directly to Africa, which I remember I told you about uh, in triangular trade earlier. Or they're going to smuggle items to other countries. Now, again, the colonists do this because they felt like they were suddenly being controlled way more than was fair, and they had already kind of a, a dwindling respect for English authority. At the time, the English king was King James II, and he is going to be very unhappy with this, basically, disrespect for his authority. And so what he's going to do uh, is he's especially going to go after New England. He goes after New England because New England was the, uh, the area where a lot of the shipping happened. Remember, they were the ones that built the ships that transported things like tobacco, like timber, like things that have been mined, any kind of gold or silver that have been found. And he's basically, go basically going to strip all of the New England uh, colonies of their individual power and put them almost under a dictatorship under a what I'll call a governor general named Sir Edmund Andros. And he is going to take the individual colonies and he's going to lump them all together in uh, what's known as the Dominion of New England. And he does all of this in an effort to crack down on smuggling. But obviously this is going to have a very negative, or it's going to spark a very negative reaction among the colonists. The colonists are going to feel like they're being oppressed more than ever before, more than they were ever used to. And this uh, Governor General, Edmund Andros, is going to be very strict, and he is going to enforce the Navigation Acts. He's going to bring in taxes uh, that are very unpopular. And this is going to be uh, a very negative moment in the relationship between the colonists and the mother country. So uh, what ends up happening is that the relationship is going to worsen. Now in the end England is going to back off and in the end the relationship is going to be repaired at least for the time being. Uh, but at this point in history uh, the, the colonists are very unhappy, uh, they don't like the Navigation Acts, uh, and this is really kind of a historical parallel to things that you'll see later on, like the Stamp Act or the Sugar Act or the Intolerable Acts or uh, the Boston or the Tea Act, uh, things like the Boston Tea Party. Uh, this foreshadows that sort of thing going on. In this case, uh, the the English government is going to back off of the Navigation Acts. Uh, whenever the American Revolution happens, England will not back off, and so the American colonists will declare independence. So what ends up happening in England is there's going to be a revolution, and this is more of a world history thing, so I'm going to be very brief on it, but in the end, James II is going to be removed from power, Edmund Andros is going to be removed from power, and the dominion of the New England is going to end, and the enforcement of the Navigation Acts, the strict enforcement, is going to end. They're still on the books, but their enforcement is going to be lessened. Uh, now, the problem for, for James II is that he wasn't just harsh on the colonies, he was also harsh on England as well, and that led to his uh, removal uh, from power. And you're going to see the English create what's known as a Bill of Rights. And this Bill of Rights is important because, as you probably know, the United States Constitution has a Bill of Rights, and some of it mirrors what you saw in the English Bill of Rights. So just like free speech is part of the English Bill of Rights, you see uh, free speech as the First Amendment of our Bill of Rights. Uh, some of the Bill of Rights had to do with jury trials. Some of the American uh, Constitution's Bill of Rights has to do with jury trials. Uh, our Eighth Amendment to the Constitution forbids cruel and unusual punishment, uh, and that can be also traced back to the English Bill of Rights. So what ends up happening is much nicer leaders, William and Mary, are going to take over in England, and they are going to restore to the colonies much of the freedom that they had had before. To the colonists, a lot of them felt like their rights as Englishmen had been violated during James II's rule, and now they feel like they're getting their rights back. However, if this sort of situation ever happens again, it could lead to a revolution. And as you probably are aware, this sort of situation does happen again around 100 years later uh, whenever the Stamp Act and the Tea Act and the Intolerable Acts and all those laws are going to be passed by the English government under King George III.
So basically, over a century before the American Revolution, you do have a century a, a, a situation arise uh, that could have led to some sort of revolution had things not been resolved peacefully and had England not backed down. Okay, finally, I'm going to talk about two major trends that happen in the colonies a philosophical movement and a religious movement. So if you look at the charts you see in front of you, you'll see the philosophical movement on the left, the religious movement on the right, and then I'll bring together how both of them fed eventually into the American Revolution, and that'll be the conclusion of this lecture and this unit. Okay, so uh, this is at the very end of the unit, but this is one of the most important things of the entire unit, and that's going to be the Enlightenment. And this is something that you should have learned about in world history. So the Enlightenment is going to be a movement, uh, and uh, this movement is going to be very emphasizing on logic, on science, and on reasoning, and it's going to really challenge a lot of previously held notions. It's going to challenge the idea of the divine right of kings, the idea that kings can do what they want because God's the one that put them in power. Uh, so I'll talk more about that in a moment. First, let me talk about a common belief among many Enlightenment thinkers, and that's going to be the idea of deism. Deism is a quasi-religious belief that many Enlightenment thinkers did uh, believe in. In fact, some of your founding fathers weren't exactly Christians. They actually were uh, deists. Ben Franklin would have been one of these. Uh, another example would be uh, Thomas Jefferson, the writer of the Declaration of Independence, and or the main writer, and third president of the United States. Uh, so deists, they believed in God, but in a very limited way. They basically did not believe in miracles. They did not believe that God interacted with uh, the world in any personal way. They believed that God had created the world, created the, the laws of nature, and had left it at that. Uh, the, the, the idea or the image would have been of this uh, kind of watch or clockmaker God that makes the clock, makes the watch, winds it up, and then kind of just sets it going on its own. So deists did not believe, for example, that Jesus uh, was divine. They did not believe in miracles. They believed basically God had set up the world and had been letting it go like a wound up clock ever since. I'm talking about that because there will be a religious reaction to this later on. Okay, this guy here doesn't look super interesting, I know. However, he is uh, the largely the inspiration for the American Revolution. There's going to be a change in thinking in, among the colonists, and it's going to be largely because of the work of John Locke. So there you see John Locke with his locks of hair, if that helps you remember him, then fine. Uh, and he is going to promote two major ideas. So if you are highlighting or drawing little asterisks or writing in bold, this is the time to emphasize, this is the time to underline or, or highlight these next two bullets, especially, actually this next little section, this whole slide you need to make sure that you understand. So John Locke is going to promote this idea of natural rights. He's going to promote this idea that people are born with certain rights. They're born with a right to life, a right to be alive. They're born with a right to liberty, in other words, freedom. And they are born with the right to have property. This idea of life, liberty, and property should be familiar to you because it basically gets, if you will, plagiarized in the Declaration of Independence when Thomas Jefferson talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which to some people, the pursuit of happiness is the pursuit of property. Now, I'm not necessarily endorsing that idea, but that is uh, a notion. Uh, and then he also talks beyond natural rights. He says not only are, is everyone born with a right to life and to liberty and to property, but it's the government's job to protect the people's natural rights. And that is known as compact theory. Now, my students have always been able to remember natural rights very well, very easily. Compact theory, not so much. So you might want to take special note of compact theory and tell yourself to make sure you understand it because students have struggled with this in the past. A compact is an agreement. We've already learned about the Mayflower Compact. John Locke is going to say that there is a, an unofficial agreement, if you will, between the government and its people. A government's purpose isn't just to rule and to have power. A government's purpose is to protect people's natural rights. That's the agreement. Which means that in the end, the government is in charge because the people let the government be in charge. The government rules at the consent of the governed. And think to yourself, how could a government break this compact? 
and therefore lose its right to rule over the people. It can do that basically by failing to protect people's natural rights. So there's this idea, again, that uh, people have natural rights and that uh, the government's sole purpose, or main purpose at least, is to protect their natural rights. And if it doesn't protect their natural rights, then the government should be gotten rid of. And that is going to play into the American Revolution because by 1776, a lot of Americans feel, through, because of various actions from the English government, that the government is no longer protecting their natural rights, and therefore the English government should be abolished. In fact, what you're going to see in Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence is he's going to declare natural rights, he's going to declare compact theory, and then he's going to go through a long list of reasons why King George III has violated people's natural rights, and therefore uh, independence is justified. Uh, one other thing that happens, or one other major Enlightenment belief that becomes common, is going to come from a man named uh, Baron Montesquieu. Uh, and he is going to promote his ideas on how a government should be structured, and he does not promote kings. He promotes this idea of a divided government, and if you've taken civics already, this should be familiar to you. He promotes the idea of separation of powers, the idea that the government should be divided into branches. Uh, an executive branch, a judicial branch, and a legislative branch, and that's what we see in today's Constitution and in today's government. And the reason for this is because if you only have one branch of government, then that branch of government could become like a dictator over the people. So not only do you separate the power of government into branches, then you, you then follow that up by intentionally setting these branches to limit each other's power. So in today's government, for example, the president uh, can be impeached and kicked out of office by the Congress. Uh, the Congress can pass a law, but then the president can veto it. Uh, the president and the Congress have to agree on who gets put on the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court can rule any action from the president or from Congress to be unconstitutional. So they do limit each other's power, and this does prevent a dictatorship. Again, this is something you should have learned about in civics. You'll see this again whenever I talk about the creation of the Constitution in the next, uh, in Unit 3. It'll be at the beginning of Unit 3. Okay, one final uh, event that happens that sort of relates to the Enlightenment uh, is going to be a challenge to the idea of whether or not you can criticize government leaders. Now remember that for a long time before the Enlightenment, there was this idea that the king's word went. And if the king said something, it was law because God had put the king in power. Uh, the idea was that God had put all people that were in power in their positions of power. Therefore, whatever they said uh, was God's will. Well, there's going to be a case in the New York colony just a few decades before the American Revolution in 1733 where a man named John Peter Zinger is going to be put on trial for criticizing the governor of New York. Now the governor of New York was a royal governor which meant he had been appointed by the king and uh, so basically if you're questioning the New York government uh, governor you're kind of questioning the king himself and that doesn't go over very well with a lot of, uh, of, of uh, the people in power at the time. Now what John Peter Zinger had done is he had basically taken out some newspaper articles and had criticized the New York governor and he had actually said things that were true. However, he still gets put on trial for being critical of the people in power. He is going to be found not guilty. And that is incredibly important because he technically had violated the law because the law at the time had said you couldn't speak badly about the governor even if what you said was true. However, the jury finds him to be not guilty. And what that does is, again, it does relate to this idea that if the governor isn't doing what the people like, uh, in terms of like, for example, protecting natural rights, then they should be called out for it. So this does relate to the Enlightenment idea of the government ruling by the consent of the governed. And in this case, you see someone saying that they don't like what the government's doing, and they're being very vocal about it. But what this also does is it sets a precedent of criticizing those in power. And if you know your Constitution, you know that part of the First Amendment is freedom of the press. The freedom of the news, whether it be newspapers back then, or television, or the internet uh, news uh, companies, 
it establishes the freedom of the news to criticize the government, almost acts like a fourth branch of government to hold the government accountable. So those are all things related to the Enlightenment. Now let's go over to the other box, the one that's about a religious movement, and then I'll come to how the Enlightenment and the religious movement known as the Great Awakening come together. So there's going to be a religious movement that happens in the colonies, and that's going to be known as the Great Awakening. Now, some of you might know someone that has some very religious parents. Maybe you have some very religious parents, and you know that just because the parents are religious, it does not mean the kids are religious. It doesn't mean the grandkids are religious. And so you have the same situation happen in the colonies. Uh, so the Puritans, obviously, were very religious. That's the reason behind the, their, their uh, coming to the New World. Their children were not as religious. Their grandchildren were not as religious. And as the generations went on, the colonists had become less and less religious. Now, what tends to happen in this country is we tend to go through phases where the country is more religious and times when they are less religious. At this point, uh, you see that the country has gotten less religious. Some people are turning to deism and away from Christianity. And there's going to be a backlash to this. And that's going to be known as the Great Awakening. Uh, the Great Awakening is a major religious revival of Christianity in the colonies. And you are going to start seeing some changes in the style of religion, if you will. For example, as a result of the Great Awakening, uh, well, let me rewind. So, for example, the Puritans. The Puritans, whenever they preach, they preach in a very kind of lecture style, kind of like you're hearing from me now. Uh, in the Great Awakening, you're going to start seeing some preachers resort to um, appealing to people's emotions. They... Uh, try to excite feelings maybe of guilt among people, saying, you know, if you don't change your ways, then you're going to be going to hell. So there's guilt that's going to be emphasized sometimes. Fear is sometimes going to be uh, emphasized. This is not a Puritan version of Christianity. It is Christianity in a different form, but it's not the Puritan brand of it. And the reason I'm telling you that it is different from Puritanism is because it means that people are challenging the old religious ways, if you will. So uh, you are going to see lots of people suddenly becoming religious. You are going to start seeing uh, large public revivals, large meetings like you see in the picture here. But you also see this idea of a rejection of traditional church authority. The Puritan way might not be the right way to be a Christian. And if you see a, tradition, a, a rejection of traditional church authority in the southern colonies, keep in mind that in the southern colonies, uh, they were members of the Anglican Church. And the Anglican Church, remember the head of the Anglican Church is the king himself. So if you are seeing a movement that rejects traditional church authority, in the south that means rejecting maybe the authority of the king. And it does, uh, of course, set the precedent for rejecting the king's authority uh, in the American Revolution. So some people might reject the king because they think he violates compact theory. Some people reject the king because they start to believe that he's not really truly the head of the church and that it's not the church that gets you quote-unquote saved. It would be your own personal connection with God himself. I'll quickly mention a couple of famous preachers and if you've taken uh, American uh, literature, I believe that's taught mostly to juniors. If you've taken that class, you've probably heard of Jonathan Edwards. I'll talk about him here. Uh, in some of your English classes, you may have heard of, of him. He had a famous uh, sermon known as Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So one of your major preachers will be Jonathan Edwards. He will deliver a very scary sermon multiple times where he basically convinces lots of people that God is basically aching to send them to hell, he's ready to send them to hell, and they better change their way now before they're cast into the fire. So that'll be Jonathan Edwards, uh, his, and he will convert many people using the emotion of fear, but he does convert a lot of people. Another one of your preachers will be a man named George Whitfield. Uh, he was known for uh, his style. He was known for his booming voice. He had a voice that could carry for a very long distance. He could probably speak to 10,000 people without any kind of help from any kind of microphones or megaphones or anything. Of course, he didn't have microphones back then. Uh, but if you were around George Whitfield, you could probably still hear him, even in a crowd of 10,000. That's just how loud he was. And both of these preachers were very convincing to a lot of Americans. And 
you will start to see a lot of people converting back to Christianity, but not necessarily to the Christianity of their forefathers. Or mothers. So uh, the impact of the Great Awakening, there's going to be multiple impacts. Uh, you will see the American churches kind of split. You're going to see uh, the older churches that maintain more traditional authority, maybe the Puritan brand or the Anglican brand of, of uh, Christianity. But you see more and more people starting to question traditional authority, and uh, they will not be known as the old lights, as the more conservative uh, colonists were. They will be known as the new lights. They will be the ones that are going to be much more emphasizing of a personal relationship with God that bypasses any kind of church authority. And remember, if you're an Anglican, that means you're bypassing the authority of the king who's the head of your church. So, uh, again, you're going to see this idea of questioning traditional authority. And if you're going to question the traditional authority of your church, you might also question the traditional authority of your government. Especially, if you're an Anglican, where the church and the government are very closely related. Another reason that this is going to create... Uh, a condition where people are more likely to uh, declare independence or have less loyalty to England is that this happens in the colonies. This Great Awakening does not happen in England. So this is one of those sort of you had to be there things and if you weren't there you didn't really understand it. So it kind of relates to this idea that uh, the colonies are starting to develop their own culture and they're starting to develop their own history that's separate from England. So uh, the, the longer that they are split away from England by an ocean of thousands of miles, the less loyalty they'll have to this uh, English government, the more they're going to start forming their own identity. Okay, so let's bring these ideas together, and then we'll be done with the unit. Uh, and there you see in the picture there uh, the five people that kind of teamed up together to help write the Declaration of Independence, and you'll see there that uh, Benjamin Franklin was one of them, uh, John Adams was one of them, and I'm not sure which one. I'm not sure which one this picture is John Adams, but here you see Thomas Jefferson, the primary writer. So I'm foreshadowing, again, the, the independence movement. So the Enlightenment uh, movement is going to change people's thinking and make them start to think that maybe England is violating their natural rights and violating their compact to protect their natural rights. And this is an absolutely revolutionary change in thinking about government. All of a sudden, people are going to start saying to themselves that power doesn't come from the top down. It doesn't come from the king down. It doesn't come from the government down. Ultimately, it comes from the people, and they're the ones that have the uh, power to decide if a government is legitimate or not. And if the government doesn't protect their natural rights and violates the compact theory, then there's the right to get rid of that government. Put on top of that the Great Awakening, which made people question traditional authority in general, it's also going to translate to them questioning England's traditional authority. So again, the American uh, colonists by 1776 are intellectually, mentally primed. They're, they're, they're kind of conditioned to be uh, much more questioning of England's authority over them. You put on top of that the stuff from the front side of this lecture where I talked about how most people weren't even from England, and if they were from England, uh, then uh, they weren't actually born in England and thus felt very loose ties to England. All of these things put together are going to, by 1776 and in the decade before it, are going to make Americans consider independence from England in 1776. You put on top of that the fact that colonists felt like their uh, freedom had been abused by the Navigation Acts, and they're not exactly willing to go through all that again. Uh, whenever England starts to clamp down, uh, starting in 1750 uh, or 1763, moving through to 1776, there are so many things in this lecture that basically foreshadow the coming of the American Revolution. Again, a waning allegiance to England because people weren't born in England, they were born here. Uh, a lot of them weren't ever from England. You put on top of that the fact that they are used to local government, and any time that the uh, English government tries to clamp down on them, there's a rejection of that clamping down. You combine that with the Enlightenment. You combine that with the Great Awakening. By 1776, the American people largely, though not entirely, and actually it's not even a majority movement at first, 
uh, they are going to be at least ready to consider independence in 1776. And with that, I conclude the last lecture of the last unit. Make sure you study all of your lecture notes. Uh, your test will be all the things in your test will come from either a key terms list or from these lectures. So it's vital that you uh, take these lecture notes and that you study them. And that concludes the lecture.